When we stroll around Chester city walls, enjoying the views over the river or along Eastgate Street, or even use them just as a way of getting from one part of town to another, it's hard not to be aware of their age. Their irregularity and the weathering of the stone tell us that, and most of us know of their Roman origin, but the details of their complicated history are less well known. It's those complications and the evidence for that history that are actually in plain sight that I want to explore today. In particular, I want to focus on the oldest section of the walls that has its origins in Roman times. For reasons that will become clear, this is the part that is most prone to collapse and nowadays needs most repair. But the investigations that have accompanied those repairs for almost 150 years also means that we know quite a lot about them. I'm standing by the foundations of the southeast angle tower of the Roman fortress. It's a good place to start our story because it encapsulates the multi-period history of the city walls. It marks the junction of the, the Roman defences to the north and the medieval extension to the south. Next to it is the New Gate. Up to the 16th century, earlier versions of this gate were called the Wolf Gate, a name which is probably of Scandinavian derivation and may hint at a, an origin for the gate before the Norman Conquest. Th this corner of the Roman fortress was only discovered in 1908 when the city's first telephone exchange, now off the wall, was built. The Angle Tower itself was excavated in 1930 when some cottages were demolished. Up to that time, the extent of the Roman fortress was a matter of debate, but the discovery of this corner settled the matter once and for all. Behind the Angle Tower is the present city wall. This was rebuilt in the 1930s and the Saxon crosshead, probably, probably from St John's churchyard, was found in its core. So what was the circuit of the Roman walls and how can we recognise it today? From the southeast Angle Tower, they ran north to, to King Charles Tower and then west as far as the modern St Martin's Gate over the inner ring road. At various points along these stretches, the huge squared blocks that are characteristic of Chester's Roman walls survive projecting outside the present city wall, especially at the Caveards, or still standing to their full height east of the North Gate. The south and west defences have long since disappeared from view, but their line is known from excavation. From the southeast Angle Tower, they ran to the north of Pepper Street, just under the Grosvenor Shopping Centre, across the end of Bridge Street, then between Cupping Street and Whitefriars to near the Magistrates Court. Here they turn north, just inside the inner ring road, to rejoin the surviving wall at St Martin's Gate. There are three clues to the line of these now vanished walls. First, the churches at the former gates and angles. St Michael's and St Bridget's at the south gate at the bottom of Bridge Street, and Holy Trinity at the west gate at the end of Watergate Street, as well as St Martin's by the southwest angle tower near the Magistrates' Courts. St Bridget's was demolished in 1828 when Grosvenor Street was built and St Martin's in 1964 when Nicholas Street was widened as part of the construction of the inner, inner ring road. These churches may originally have made use of the remains of Roman structures and their positions may have had a symbolic significance. Second, the narrowly spaced streets that flank their line and would have given access to the land on each side and to the walls themselves. This is seen well in Whitefriars inside the old walls and Cupping Street outside, with the former churches of St Bridget and St Martin at each end. Third, the difference in ground level inside and outside the former walls, seen most clearly at the southwest angle. We don't know precisely when the southern and western Roman defences were dismantled, but it was pre presumably after the construction of the medieval extension in the 12th century, and it may have taken place over quite a long period. There is a fundamental difference between the medieval and Roman defences that explains why it is the second, the Roman sectors, that continue to need more repair. The medieval defences were prob probably built from the outset as conventional walls with a core and two faces, although there was no need for an inner face in some places where the wall is on the edge of a slope where it overlooks the river and the Rudé. By contrast, 
The Roman defences were built piecemeal. They originally consisted of a turf rampart. Only later was a stone facing added at the front with rubble packing between it and the soft turf. It is the attempts to build upon the remains of this hybrid construction that have caused so many com complications. The Roman fortress and its defences were built in the mid 70s AD. Excavations along the line of the western defences and investigations in the course of repairs to the north wall have taught us a lot about the construction of the original rampart. It was built of two tapering cheeks of turf, each six feet to eight feet wide, two metres or so, with a spoil and rubble core, with a total width of 20 feet or six metres at the base and a possible height of 10 or 15 feet, that's three or four and a half metres. The four gateways and over 30 towers would have been of timber, but traces of these have only been found in three places, at the southwest angle by the north gate and east of the north gate at Abbey Green. In some excavations, the outlines of the individual turfs can sometimes be seen, measuring about one foot by one foot by four inches. That's 30 by 30 by 10 centimetres, with timber strapping at int vertical intervals of about one foot. In front of the rampart, there was a berm about six feet wide and a ditch five feet deep and 10 feet wide. About AD 100, a stone facing was added at the front of the rampart with rubble packing between it and the soft turf. It consisted of massive blocks of sandstone up to, up to six feet long and three feet six inches, one meter broad and approximately one foot or 30 centimetres high, laid without mortar. It is the stonework of this wall that you can still see in places today. Just east of the north gate, the wall survives to its full height, about 15 feet or 4.5 metres, from the chamfered plinth at the bottom to the decorated cornice at what would have been wall walk height. Above that, you can see some rounded blocks with slots cut to receive the parapet. Nothing now survives of the stone gateways of the fortress, but much of the Roman East Gate was found embedded in the medieval gate when that was dismantled in 1766 to be replaced by the present gate. Fortunately, a detailed drawing was made of the remains. The monumental size of the masonry in the curtain wall and gates contrast with the use of much smaller stonework in other forts and elsewhere in Chester, for example, in the towers around the walls. It was clearly meant to impress. At this time, the old ditch was replaced by a new one, about 24 feet or over 7 metres wide and 8 feet uh, 2.4 metres deep. Sometime after the middle of the third century, parts of the wall seemed to have fallen forwards, with rubble falling into the ditch. One reason for this may have been that early in that century, the ditch was recut and its edge was brought closer to the wall. Signs of this collapse have been found during ex excavations in 1989 be behind what is currently the Cruise nightclub on St John Street and along Linen Hall Street. The wall then seems to have been rebuilt, often using the same blocks, but also shorter, taller ones, and notably making use of a lot of tombstones, particularly in the north wall. In fact, most of the north wall seems to have been rebuilt West of King Charles's Tower, the width of the wall was increased to 10 feet, as it was also north of the West Gate facing Linen Hall Street. The section drawing shows the original wall and the fallen rubble in dark purple and the rebuilt wall in lighter purple. It has been argued that this rebuilding happened not in Roman times, but in the Saxon period, most probably when Ethelfled, Lady of the Mercians, refortified Chester in AD 907. It's also possible that the different widths of wall represent different episodes of rebuilding. However, at the moment, it does seem more likely that the rebuilt wall is late Roman. At Linen Hall Street in 1962, large post holes associated with late Saxon pottery were found cut into the remains of the Roman rampart, and these seem likely to represent the remains of a 10th century palisade. More evidence for the sequence of events comes from the St John Street 1989 excavation. It was found that the rebuilt wall 
had also collapsed forward like its predecessor, fracturing the stones left in place. Rubble combined with the remains of the wall and the old rampart, and it's possible that a palisade was built on top of this, as at Linen Hall Street. A shallow ditch had been cut into the remains of the Roman wall. Ultimately, the wall was set further back to gain stability, cut into the Roman rampart, with a new, larger ditch in front. This is the line followed by much of the east wall today, from the southeast angle tower to the east gate and northward to the kale yards, and is the reason that sections of the Roman wall are visible in front of the present city wall. It's worth noting how the present wall at the southeast and northeast corners also cuts diagonally behind the rounded corners of the Roman curtain wall, leaving the angle towers projecting. Buttresses projecting from the outer face of the city wall by the side of King Charles Tower may indeed be the side walls of the Roman angle tower. In the sections that we are concerned with, there is remarkably little evidence for the wall in the medieval period. Remains of a short section of the curtain wall were found embedded in the present wall north of the East Gate in 2015. The town ditch was dug on the north and east sides in 1264. And Thimblebiz Tower, north of the New Gate, the Drum Tower by the steps to North Fodgham Street, and the now vanished Saddler's Tower, north of the Cale Yard Gate, may have been built soon afterwards. The Drum Tower is marked on a 1588 map of Chester and was excavated in 1928. The position of Saddler's Tower is shown on a map of 1745. It was demolished in 1828, but its position is marked by two buttresses on the outer face of the city wall. The North Gate and the East Gate are recorded from the later 12th century. Both were on the sites of Roman gates, and as we have seen, the medieval East Gate incorporated much of its Roman predecessor. In the late 13th century, the East Gate was referred to as the Porta Kestriae, the Gate of Chester, suggesting that it was the principal gate into the city as it remains today. There is a drawing by Randall Holm of the medieval gate in its grandest form before it was damaged in the Civil War, and part of the gate was discovered under the Foregate Street during repairs to a sewer in 1972. In the 16th century, the walls became increasingly ruinous as the trade of the city declined. After the Civil War, repairs were made to breaches in the circuit, and more repairs continued in the 1660s to 1690s. In 1707-8, the City Assembly made a grant of £1,000 to restore the whole circuit to use, and from this time the walls became a fashionable promenade with an unfortified parapet and flagged wall walk. Repairs continued through the 18th and early 19th century, and it's not until this time that we are certain that the wall between the Newgate and Morgan's Mount had an inner masonry face. Even this rebuilding was not done thoroughly enough to guarantee the long-term stability of the walls, as we have seen with the recent collapses by the side of the Grosvenor Hotel in 2008 and along Newgate Street in 2020. Along the North Wall and by the Cailliard Cottage, the city wall was rebuilt partly on top of the Roman Wall, rather than behind it as elsewhere, and this has been a major reason for it having been so unstable and having needed so much repair from the, the late 19th century onwards. These repairs have led to the discovery of many of the Roman tombstones and architectural fragments that are now an important part of the collection of the Grosvenor Museum. The repairs have also played a major role in our advancing our understanding of the walls. First of all, a section opposite the end of Canning Street collapsed in 1883, where there is now a small arch. In 1887, a stretch of the wall west of King Charles Tower was repaired. The section drawing by I.M. Jones, the city surveyor, shows the later wall of poor construction and needing repair perched precariously on top of the late Roman wall incorporating reused stones. Much of the wall west of the North Gate was rebuilt in 1892, but even so needed major repair in 1989-90. The second drawing shows a section through this part of the wall. The dark purple shows the Roman foundation course and turf rampart, now partly under Water Tower Street. 
the pale purple, is the rebuilt Roman wall. This was re-erected in a vertical position in 1892. Where it had not been re-erected, it leant forward. The green is the back face of the medieval or post-medieval wall. The rest is late 19th century rebuild and widening using earlier stonework. I'm standing in the Northgate Gardens on the path leading from the arch opposite Canning Street down to the locks on the canal. This is one of the lengths of wall completely dismantled and rebuilt in 1989-90 and is illustrated in the last section drawing that I showed you. This is where the late 19th century rebuilding finished. To the west, what you can see is a short length of what may be 18th century wall standing on Roman masonry below ground. To the east, several courses of Roman walls survive above ground level. Fragments of decorative stonework used in what we think was the late Roman rebuilding were set into the face of the wall where you can see them today. When the wall was reconstructed in, in the late 19th century, sections of the Roman wall that were leaning outward were rebuilt in a vertical position to provide a satisfactory footing for the wall above. So, as you can see, Chester's walls have a long and complicated history that is intertwined with that of the city as a whole, and we have only skimmed the surface. For instance, there is some evidence that the Roman stone walls, started about AD 100, may not have been completed until the early 3rd century. The date of the major rebuilding using re reused stones is hotly disputed. Was it late Roman or was it Ethelfleden? and we know remarkably little about the structure of the medieval walls. I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation and that as you walk around the walls in the future, you will spot some of the details that I have talked about and even when the Roman defences have now vanished, see their influence on the townscape.